Yes, uh, so thank you so much for joining us for today's event. My name is Nick and I'm one of the events hosts here at Howell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I wanna encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual and live events by visiting our website at Howells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. But tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Lydia Conklin in conversation with Lee Newman talking about Lydia's new book, Rainbow Rainbow. Lydia Conklin has received a Stegner Fellowship, a Rona Jaff Foundation Writers Award, three Pushcart Prizes, a Creative Writing Fulbright in Poland, and many other honors. Their fiction has appeared in Tin House, American Short Fiction, and the Paris Review. They've drawn comics for The New Yorker, The Believer, Lenny Letter, and elsewhere. In their exuberant, their exuberant prize-winning story collection, Rainbow Rainbow, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming characters seek love and connection in hilarious and heart-rending stories that reflect the complexity of our current moment. A non-binary writer on the eve of top surgery enters into a risky affair during the height of COVID. A lesbian couple enlists a close friend as their sperm donor, plying him with potent rainbow-colored cocktail. A lonely office worker struggles with their gender identity, uh, chaperones their nephew to a trans YouTube convention. And in the depths of a Midwestern winter, a sex addicted librarian relies on her pet ferrets to help resist a relapse at a wild college fair. <laughs> That's right. Rainbow Rainbow captures both the dark and lovable sides of the queer and trans experience and establishes Conklin as a fearless new voice for their generation. Conklin will be joined in conversation by Lee Newman, author of the collection, Nobody Gets Out Alive and the memoir Still Points North and winner of such awards as the Pushcart Prize, the American Society of Magazine Editors Fiction Prize and the Paris Review's Terry Southern Prize. Today's event will include an audience Q&A. So please use the Q&A bot button at the bottom of this, your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Lastly, support Lydia and Powell's by purchasing a copy of their book from us. A link to buy Rainbow Rainbow will be shared in the chat a couple of times. Lydia and Lee, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this virtual event. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, it's so exciting, isn't it? I couldn't help that I was already, because the story about the librarian is one of my favorites. Um, so just to preface this for people in out there, which I can't see, but I wish I could, but I'm not even Zoom um, literate enough to be able to turn on people's faces. Um, uh, Lydia and I met long ago in Bread Loaf at 2014. And Lydia gave a reading, a two minute long reading. And I was in the audience, I was a fellow, I had done my reading and I was like, Lydia can really write. For two minutes, she blew me away. And then I was waiting and waiting to see what would happen. And then uh, when this book came out, this wonderful book, um, I was an editor at Catapult and I acquired it. So I feel that we have a deep uh, understanding of, of each other's work and of the short story. And I thought we could talk a little about that librarian story because originally we had thought to make the librarian story um, a recovering, did I want to make that the first story or did? No, you wanted to make Counselor of My Heart, the, but they didn't want to do the dog. I know, yeah. Counselor of My Heart is also another great one because, but both of them illustrate something. So in Counselor of My Heart, um, uh, a young woman is staying at her girlfriend's apart, uh, dorm room. The, the, the girlfriend works at like Harvard and is taking care of all these sort of like um, clueless freshman college students who don't know what to do and she's away for the weekend and so the central character takes care of her dog and then actually uh drowns the dog which sounds dark but it's actually quite funny um and then goes back home and gets really stoned in the dorm room and entertains some hapless freshman that wanders by but the whole story is actually kind of lit up by the love that um the young woman feels for her her missing girlfriend called counselor of my heart that's what she calls her when she doesn't she work at a hot dog stand yeah a vegan one yeah of course vegan <laughs> vegan of course vegan. because everything in the story and in like in the librarian story is real but maybe a little bit heightened mm -hmm. right can you talk about that 
Yeah, so I like I I've never put speculative elements in my fiction, but I do like going as weird as possible within the realm of reality and within the realm of sort of like an emotional reality that makes sense in the emotional lives of the characters, but is surprising and strange in however way I can push it with getting away with it. Well, I mean, how do you do that? Sometimes you do do that. Like we were talking earlier about how you use language sometimes, like when you said one of her characters is like, and then I grew salad on the windowsill. And when I was editing that, I was like, people don't go salad on the windowsill, Lydia. What, what, I know, are you, lettuce? Like there's ways with language and imagery you can do that, but also with situation. Can you talk a little bit about different ways that you make that happen? Yeah, I think you're you're right, like on the language level, trying to surprise people with how I describe things as best as possible or try to sort of illuminate things in like a new or uncanny way that's fresh. Because, um, you know, if you see the same language describing things in a common way, it's, it's hard to really visualize it because it doesn't pop to life. But if you're able to find like a a cool like I in your in your story because Lee's story collection just came out last month and in her first story there's one of the characters sons is described I think as like a wheezy fellow and I feel like I could see him Donald poor Donald Donald. (laughs) (laughs) I know but that is I mean one thing I love about working with you and probably there was some reason why I responded to your work so much is because I probably narcissistically though unconsciously saw that we would be you know story siblings um, in that heightened sense of reality and also in like the use of humor to kind of so in your subject matter in a lot of stories like that librarian story I mean she really is struggling with like a sex addiction and it's a serious thing you know like some of the thoughts in there is that she has about like you know young college students that she's walking past and her friend trying to help her and you know it is like there are real stakes here right but somehow the humor softens it right or Adds, adds another different angle the way we're talking about that you can do that is unexpected that kind of for me, you know, takes me to that world and then kind of, ow, stabs me in the heart a little bit, you know? Yeah. I know for a fact that I do that in my stories. I don't think I yeah. knew what I was doing until I read your stories and realized, oh, we have totally different worlds, but it's similar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I feel like the dream for me is to have the hu- humor and sadness in the same stories if I can stab them in the heart and yeah. make them laugh. That's that's the dream for me because I feel like those are the two heights of emotion that you can evoke. Yeah. And, so. and also, do you think sometimes too that like, were you worried earlier in your career like that if you were funny, people wouldn't take you, think you were serious? Did you ever worry about that? Yeah, but I, I don't know if I did because I feel like I just want to make people laugh at all. I, at all costs. I <laughs> like, said that question. I was like, I don't care really. I wasn't yeah, really yeah. afraid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not now. But yeah. you know, I do think it's going to be an interesting moment in, you know, when there's maybe we'll start a movement that you can be funny and an extremely literary, serious, dark writer, right? Yes, I think maybe we should teach and train other young writers coming up and then we can form some weird school in the woods. Yeah, because um, sometimes people are so funny in real life and then I read their book and I'm like, I don't see the person at all in here. Yeah, like, oh, and I do think sometimes people think they have to take on this like desperate Scandinavian tone, like this is all going to come, and especially right now for you coming out and talking about trans issues, talking about you have characters that transition, you have characters that have sex addiction, you have characters that, um, you know, are in, you know, uh, not able to tell their family, you know, what their orientation is, young kids who are trying, struggling. These are like really serious stories and they could all be retold in a voice that's like, da-dum. And I'm not negating that voice. I like a lot of serious, serious writers, right? But there's something joyful about this collection dealing with all of these issues. That's a question. That's a question. Yeah, I did want the joy to come through for sure, because I feel like a lot of the, you know, Hollywood stories about queer people or trans people, like someone always, you know, kills themselves at the end or whatnot. And like, I wanted to write a book that had joy in it and had nuance and had like the complexity of the real lived experience of being a queer person, not just this one Hollywood narrative of tragedy. Right. That I just 
had absorbed over and over again as a young person and I think it, it it's it's those stories are true for sure and important but I think there needs to be more of a diversity of of experience represented mm -hmm. and you um in the last story though so the last story and I I know that we did this together but I remember why we were deciding the last story would be the last story and it's it concerns um a person who come who's spending some time in Poland um and with uh I think two gay men or men of different different orientations or and and what happens at the end is that the the narrator who's transitioning but hasn't told their girlfriend jumps off this cliff like literally a cliff into a quarry filled with like old junk not in a suicide way yeah. just like shedding their past right yeah. and in a way the last story opens up to a whole other new book right you know to me that's what it felt like you know because we had all these different experiences of people struggling with identity or absorbing their identity or just negotiating within and then this last book this last story just kind of says like there's a whole other beginning past this book which i loved it made me feel like oh we're going to leap into the next book by lydia conklin Yes, I hope it works. That Is that way. just my brain? Yeah. No, no, that's real. That's real. I'm just thinking it reminds me of when I was little, my friend in fourth grade, my friend Tom Faust told me never read a book where the last word is again. And I, all my life, I've looked at the last words of books and I've never found one. Yeah, but why wouldn't he want you to read one that it says again at the end? Because he he read one that was very bad. That had oh, that. <laughs> he didn't have a theory about it in fourth grade. He was yeah. just like, I read a bad book that started with. A <laughs> he had a, a sample group of one, but he was very firm on it. But it made me think about like, it does seem like a book like that might be like, and it never happened again or something like yeah. that. Like, yeah. I don't know. So maybe Can you give me a favor because we're on fourth grade. Could you read some a selection from Pioneer, which is. Yes takes place in a um is it fourth grade um fifth grade fifth grade that's fifth, fifth grade. grade class about um um a young girl who they have a historical reenactment that's all I'm going to say and then you take it from there okay, okay. the Oregon Trail ran from the back entrance of Bridge Elementary down through the schoolyard to the edge of the woods cones marked the journey not the satisfying soft cones that squish down with your body weight, but hard plastic cones, prim and pointed as shark teeth. The cones looped around the tree line to the right, and that's all Coco and the rest of the Culver family could see from the starting point. Who knew where the trail went after that? There were dangers Coco had heard, though she didn't know exactly what. When Miss Harper had passed out the simulations rainbow coated biography cards last week, Coco had not been assigned to the Culver family. Her lemon yellow card listed her as the matriarch of the Bell family who had lived right here in historic Lexington, Massachusetts. Coco couldn't bear to be a matriarch. While the class wandered around collecting their families, Coco asked Devon, the Bell patriarch, if she could be a child in the Bell family instead. We already have two children, Devon said, and there can't be children without a matriarch. Sure there can, said Coco. The matriarch could have died. They'd make up some woman who'd long since perished. We're calling her benevolence could pass the time on the trail. You want to be dead, asked Devon. No, Coco said. I just don't want to be the bell matriarch. I want to be a bell child. Why? Coco wouldn't say so to Devon, but she was uneasy in dresses and skirts. The wind could catch the fabric and expose the part of her she hated most that felt so wrong and that she pretended had withered off her. In the role of a child, she'd be an 1800s tomboy. As matriarch, there was no option. She'd have to look like a full woman. Ever since Coco's body had started developing a few months ago, she focused hard on the mildew on the ceiling while she washed herself in order to forget her body. Only when the water was dirtied and lathered with soap could she bear to look down. I don't have the right clothes, she said. Miss Harper said the girls could staple a sheet, Devon said, a long sheet, like touching the ground. Won't it get dirty? Coco pictured herself as a bedraggled angel. Devon shrugged. At first, Coco considered not traveling the Oregon Trail at all. She'd never played sick before, and that seemed like the type of trick every kid should pull once. 
but missing the day would be a crazy move. Coco loved Miss Harper and would never lie to her. But beyond that, the Oregon Trail was the culmination of the fifth graders' hard work through Bridge Elementary, where you got to be a pioneer like those who traipsed around Plymouth Rock. Her classmates had chattered about the day since kindergarten when they'd first glimpsed the wagons pulled through the field by what looked like small adults. All through middle and high school, the Oregon Trail would be reminisced about as the pinnacle of their education. The day before the Oregon Trail, Coco asked the other families in Miss Harper's class if she could join up with them. Do you need a baby? She asked the Murdochs and the Hancocks, the Bakers and the Blackthorns, or an adolescent? No, they said, if they bothered with her at all. Even though it was still regular school until tomorrow, the families were already insular and protective, clumping around desks between subjects. Aren't you a matriarch yourself, the Blackthorn matriarch asked. I don't want to be, said Coco. I want to be a kid. That's stupid. Miss Harper says we have to accept our station. Yeah, said the Blackthorn son, who blew his nose on his math worksheets. Matriarchy is an incredible honor. Women rule. Want to trade, Coco asked. Doy, no. None of the girls assigned as daughters were interested in becoming matriarchs, or at least they wouldn't admit it to Coco. The best option was to join the Culver family, who offered her the role of an ox. You can pull our wagon, said Alex, the Culver family patriarch. If you can find another ox, we'll yoke you. It'll be super. What she wanted to be was a boy, like Devin or Alex, but nice. She wanted to wear short pants and follow behind a party, providing for anyone who was hungry. She wanted to be a smooth-faced, short-haired, colonial boy. At home that night, Coco stuffed yellow felt triangles with dry grass for horns and affixed them to the cap of her headgear. She prepared a poncho that simulated the powerful shoulders of an animal and tied a piece of rope to her belt for a tail. Coco, her mom said, I thought you were a matriarch. Lately, Coco hated the sound of her own name, which was like a pet's name or the name of a girl with makeup in a Western saloon, embarrassingly girlish, the verbal equivalent of balloon staple to her chest. She twitched like she'd been hit. I used to be. You look, you look like, I don't want to say it. What? Coco struggled to speak clearly. Although her headgear was for night use only, she'd hooked the mouthpiece into the metal tubes on her molars. Otherwise, the cap didn't stay taut on her head. What do I look like? Her horns flapped over her eyes. Her mom didn't answer. Well, I, I'm just smiling because what we were talking about before, like, you know, some of the verbal surprises in there are the fact that you're talking about matriarch, which I just always want to giggle because, and a lesser writer would say mother, right? Yeah. <laughs> matriarch is so like ridiculous <laughs> in dialogue. Like, honey, don't you want to be a matriarch? And then the way <laughs> you're speaking this way is, you know, that, that the boy who blows his nose on the math worksheets is like, a matriarch is an honor. You know, um, <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. I'm saying it would happen in elementary school. Someone would give them the word matriarch and then they would bandy it about, you know, um, <laughs> without you know, really fully understanding it. Yeah. Without really understanding what that's going on. And then there's other parts that are funny that she's wearing the headgear, which you just smooth on over. That's how the, the, the horns were attached on the head, you know, the <laughs> mouth was just snuck in there, these little details that so, you know, capture this whole time period, right? Yeah. But I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit about the feelings of the girl who doesn't want to be a matriarch and wants to be a child, because I think there are similar moments, like in the story, Sunny, Sunny, Tom. Tom yeah, Tom. Where, where the woman is grown up, but was from a different generation. So mm -hmm. never was allowed to transition or didn't believe that they could and mm -hmm. was trying to explore it. But in that story, that narrator also is talking about this moment in the bathroom and how to deal with this body you have that you don't want. Mm -hmm. And I just, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how it was writing those things and putting them into different situations and how it affected you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is based in, you know, in my experience in different ways. Obviously, the characters are not all, all me, but there's a lot of me in all of them. So I felt a, a clear emotional access to those parts of it. Um, and I think, like with Pioneer, that moment of, you know, dressing up for colonial times was like, for me, kind of the first moment where it's like, oh, I have to in public 
wear a dress because you can kind of get away with dressing like a boy when you're little or everybody wears shorts and t-shirts or whatever but then when it's like you can't really pull that off if you're pretending to be a colonial woman so that's like really a moment of where history kind of exposes you or kind of sneaks in to expose a person so I I was interested in that in the moments that you can pass the moments that you can get away with hiding things or the moments where it's forced to the surface like okay every girl's gonna wear a dress and every girl's gonna look like this in this situation and then it's like oh crap Right. And it kind of talks, has a larger message, whether you're sometimes as a writer, you're not able to access that. Right. But the idea of actually literally history pushing you to act like the people that came before you, who you don't want to be um, kind of, it it shows exactly the power of what goes on in our schools and, and how, you know, there's only certain types of people they ever tell you you're going to grow up to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What they say, when you can be anything you want to be, but I remember they said that address. Yeah, I I remember them saying to me in kindergarten, like they had just said for years, you can be anything you want when you grow up. And then in kindergarten, or or actually it was in preschool, I said, I well, then I would like to be a dinosaur. And they were like, laughing at me. And I was like, why are you laughing? You said I could be anything. (laughs) It was just a certain number of human professions that I could choose. True, true. And I think that those feelings too are not just limited to people that are questioning their gender. Like there's a lot of people who are comfortable being a girl, but not ready to be a woman. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between a matriarch and a, you know, and a child, right? Like that moment of confronting your body applies to a lot of people. Yeah. But can you talk about the story? Cause you know how you said like hiding different things. Can you yeah, talk yeah. about the last story where the narrator is hiding their face behind a mask that's why they want to wear a mask all the time and this was the masks were about Poland not so much about COVID right can you just talk about that a little bit yeah definitely so so yeah so that story is set in in Krakow Poland and so is the third story parts of it um but yeah it was an experience I had being in Krakow for a year before the pandemic and you have to wear a mask there because it's so it's the most polluted city in Europe and it's like people have five years shortened of lifespan because of the pollution there and so I was wearing masks all the time and I found like many people in COVID that it can kind of help obscure your gender in a way as well which happens in the story but also I just it's just funny and this is in the book but I just remember being like yay I'm leaving Poland I'll never wear a mask again and I like threw all my and I was out in the Warsaw airport and then like one month later like oh dang I need my masks again forever but I did that too you realize at the end of last year I was like things are going in the garbage and then I was like Delta what you know yeah. Yeah. I think but one week later, I had no masks. Um, oh, I don't no. know what, why I did that. It was probably me overreacting, like being <laughs> yeah. more confidence than perhaps the situation warranted. <laughs> yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about what I think the most famous story of the story that I know of the people is the beginning opening story, um, uh, which is called, I want to call Laramie. it. Laramie. Laramie. Yeah, it's Laramie. called Laramie time. Yeah. yeah. About the couple. Um, and this does bring, you know, it ties in with the other stories. Like this is about two women supposedly trying to have a baby, yeah, right? Yeah. And they're living in Laramie and one of them wants the baby more than the other. And they enlist their friend to make, to be a sperm donor. Um, yeah. And it is h- funny and hilarious, but can you just talk a little bit about that too? Because I feel like some of these, you know, some of these questions too are, are not just about gender. It's like, we're expected to be mothers, you know? Yes, the expectation. And that pressure, you know what I mean? Yeah in a relationship. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that's a pressure, like it was in my own personal life, but it also was pressing on basically everyone I knew who was, you know, of the ability to bear children and of this certain age. Um, It was like an obsessed question and conversation all the time about like, should we have kids? Should we not have kids? And I remember my friend, was who's very methodical and like like when she did online dating she did like seven 15 minute dates a night at 40 hours a week 
for like a month and found a boyfriend then that was like her way of doing it so like this is this is just the background to show like her methodology but she was like I want to read accounts from people who had children and are happy people who had children and regret it people who didn't have children and are happy and people who didn't have children and regret it but she couldn't find any accounts from people who had had children and regretted it but she was suspicious of that because she was like it's probably nobody wants to put that out there yeah, they're not going to tell you that but yeah, I know people that, I know people that regret it I look I, in their eyes and, the, and I look yeah. the child does not feel great yeah. <laughs> and is like doing drugs yes I know that yeah. child oops I should yeah. it yeah uh, <laughs> but um, they exist they're out there yes. but she couldn't find it and so yeah. I was like, I'm just interested in, in those decisions that you have to make where you cannot gather the, inf there's no way to gather the information that could help you make the decision. You have to take a leap of faith at a certain point and make a decision with a lack of information. So that's what that story is about is trying to make one of those like huge leap of faith decisions that you are ill prepared to make because there's no way to be prepared. Yeah. And also, I mean, one of the factors that I love about that is that, okay, so one of the partners decides they're going to have a baby to make their partner happy. Mm -hmm. Right. Even though they're on the fence. Yeah. And a lot of what the other, the partner um, who originally wanted to have the baby is dealing with is the choice between writing a novel, right. And having a baby and how like, it really is a choice as a writer. Right. I mean, that is a real thing. Um, you know, yeah. I, I felt like I had two kids and I lost like four novels. And I'm okay with that. I'm not one of the people that regretted it. But when you are thinking about entering a life in art, I mean, you have been writing for a while that you're not fresh out of the gate. This is your first book and your debut. And it reads like a third book because you took so much time on your craft and you spent so much time. I mean, to the people out there, Liddy even also contributed to the design of the cover, helping, you know, because uh, you, you're so talented in so many um, areas, but was there some point in your life where you're like, I'm going to just sit down and devote my, like I devote myself to writing. Like that might mean I'm going to miss out on a lot of things. Like, yeah, I'm going to go camping or something. I, you know, couldn't we talk about that a little bit? Cause you're such yeah. a serious artist. Yeah. I mean, I remember, and I think actually someone, uh, my friend Maud, who Maud Streep, who's in, in this in this audience was there in this moment, but this was actually in an animation class, not a writing class, but we took an animation class in college with this amazing animator named Mikhail Pavlatova. And she gave us this, she gave everybody a mini DVR tape um, to record their animations on. And she was like, this is the, it was like a couple of, maybe one hour of footage could fit on the tape. She was like, this is the only, tape you'll need for your entire life <laughs> because you'll never make enough animation because animation is so okay. time consuming and she was always talking about how you're just going to be in a room in a dark room laboring away and I was like oh my god what am I signing up for this sounds yeah. horrible but then that's the reality sometimes I'm like if someone observed my life they'd be like it's literally someone just standing in front of a computer for a, a billion hours. It looks like the worst life ever, but I feel like, you know, I don't know, maybe there's no way to justify the decision because it's so insane, but it has opened up my life to so many people and opportunities and jobs and students and and all that so it's 100 percent been worth it but I do think like there is a darkness to signing up for like all the time that's needed to actually make something good I mean maybe some people can just feel satisfied if they whip off something fast and don't labor away for 12 years but you don't know about that either I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who those people are and they're not my friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have, I'm always in front of the computer working and obsessing over sentences. And I, you know, even listen to when you talked about the verbs in the story and Oh Pioneer when you, um, and she said, uh, she looked down, she wished that part of her that she wished had withered off in her imagination. And I thought, Oh, withered, great verb, you know, got the feeling it's physical, it's emotional. You know, it's, it, it's, I, I, I just love that verb. And I'm always thinking about like, is that the right verb or what's the sound of the sentence? How do you compose it? And I can see you doing all that in this stuff. And that means it takes time. 
Yeah. yeah. You're not going to the campfire. No, it takes a lot of time. I'm not going to the concert in Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Bridge yeah. Park. No, I will not be doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not that fun anyway. But yeah, we don't need them. Um, so actually, do we have time? I wonder if you wanted to read a little bit more. Am I springing that on you? No, oh, I'm grand to do it. Okay, why don't you read a little bit from just from the beginning um, oh, of um let me see i'm springing this on you because i'm but i'm very happy to do it i can we actually read um can you read from a fear is, is a fearless more moral inventory the one with the librarian yes please read that just like a little bit from the beginning okay i'm in love with this librarian just p.s okay yeah she's a special lady okay so i'm gonna be in a relationship with her because she's not very trustworthy but fair, i do fair. okay yeah okay, she's cool. probably not ready for a relationship no she's not okay here we go you you read from right from the beginning you said right from the beginning just so we get to know carla promises herself and Pooja from the library that she won't engage with the mifflin street fair tomorrow won't drink with the undergrads won't even walk down her street while it's in session though her apartment and the library are both on mifflin a chilly length of residential wisconsin street that's raucous once a year carla has a sex addiction that she's been perfect for a month and she resolves to maintain Pooja offers a half-assed solution a vacation to the dells for the day she presents the idea like it's just occurred to her. You could get a room on the water park side, she says, falsely casual, her busybody hands hurting the due date stamps into a row. Rates are a joke in the off season. And this one hotel has a slide straight from the main office into the pool. Carla pictures herself in her stretched out bikini, selected to showcase the most flesh and not the least bit flattering, pitching out of a hotel room on a water slide in full view of Route 13. She promises Pooja that she won't repeat 2014. No way, not this year. She has the ferrets. I'm a mom now, she says. Pooja freshens the knot on her scarf and offers a worried smile. I'll cover for you at the library. I rearranged my schedule. That's ridiculous, I'll be fine. Carla hunches from Pooja's sagging grin and squanders her 15 minute break, gazing at the expanse of Mifflin, pristine from the street sweeper. A wobbly copy of herself watches back from the plate glass window across the road. I just love that a wobbly copy of herself, just beautiful writing. Do you know what I mean? Normally someone would say there is a, you know, reflection, but a wobbly copy and the sound of wobble and copy, you know, really. Oh, thanks. Um, um, so some of your stories are, are, there is one like rogue story in this collection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, pink, pink knives. I, I should know these titles. <laughs> we worked on these titles, yeah. knives. Um, and it's a much darker. Um, it's a much darker. It is totally serious. There's no humor in it at all. And it's about a woman who is having uh, an affair. Uh, you describe it. You describe the story. Okay, so it's set in in the sort of early months of the COVID pandemic, and it deals with a person, like a non-binary person yeah. who's beginning an open relationship with their girlfriend and who's at a long distance away, and then also is preparing to have top surgery like in a couple of months. Right. And then this person has an affair, but it's the first time it's very dangerous because of COVID, right? Yeah. So they break all the COVID regulations. Yeah. And the mask she has has pink knives on it. Yes. They have, pardon me. Butcher, not, butcher knives that are pink and purple. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the cute part. But the story is full of like anxiety and fear and risk. And um, and it's a straight shot. It almost, I remember it in my mind as being like one straight paragraph. Although maybe I, did I make that up? It's not, but it has that feel. It's big, long paragraph. I mean, a few long paragraphs. It's kind of like a, it came out like a stream. Right. How long oh. did that take you to write? I don't remember, but it came, It definitely came out in one, in a few days, really the first draft. And then it didn't get changed a ton. I don't remember you doing a ton on it. I did nothing. That's why I remembered it wrong. 
Yeah. <laughs> other stories we had back and forth, back and forth. I think if anything, I changed one edge when I read it in the manuscript, I knew yeah. it was very different. And I knew I wanted to bring up the darkness and, and seriousness up front so that all the stories, so there'd be real variety in voice. Like you'd have something funny and then kind of funny and then very serious and then maybe back young narrator, old narrator. So we had like the writer, the reader was always like surprised when they would go to the next story of yours, they'd never say, oh, this is what Lydia Conklin does. She does, you know, this goofy, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. And, and I also felt like that story was like a real contender. For me, that story is an award winner. Like it had this like, you know, feeling like, I felt like it was a dark ribbon just coming out. And I'm not surprised it only took you. And that's also different too, right? Like you're talking about how you're thinking about language. The story came out in three days. I heard, I didn't edit it. All we did was change the title. That was yeah, it. Yeah, we, we messed with the title, but that was it, yeah. Isn't that crazy? That, that is crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Thank that you. Is crazy. Now that I'm thinking about it, like I haven't looked at it basically since we stuck it in there and put that title. That's it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because most of the stories in there I really edited for like a decade. I know. But I felt like this one was special to you too. I know there's like, I mean, I know there's a lot of autobiography in all of our fiction. I mean, I know my book is about Alaska. Okay. And some people that I'm in those stories, like I know that I am, there's a narrator named Dutch. who's like 67 years old, but actually that's just me. Yeah, that is. Me, <laughs> some gray hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, have people, as your book has come out, have people been asking you specific questions like, you know, is that you, or do you feel funny about that? Or do you celebrate that? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I feel like it's enough. It's kind of, I don't know why do people say that? Like I read one of the stories and they were like, that's, that's an essay, a nonfiction essay. Someone said, and I was like, no, it's not. But I yeah. don't know, like there's things that are blatantly not the same about me than the person in the story. But I think people, I, I don't know, maybe people, maybe it is a compliment because I feel like I have invested all the stories with emotional issues that I've struggled with and, and conflicts I've had in my own mind and you know I don't know my fr my friends they also read true right it's not just yeah. that they're your conflicts you explore them so fully that it feels real actually I'm wondering I never thought of this before I asked this question because the same thing happens to me too where people say like like I'm sure people went up to Jackson Pollock and just said you threw some paint on the canvas I can yeah <laughs> yeah I could thought, yeah I kind of feel like that's going up to a fiction writer and saying you just wrote your own life it's an essay but in a way, it feels so authentic, even if it's not, in my mind, when I'm reading these. Oh, I don't you. know which ones are out of, I never asked you, we never talked about it. But Maybe you will one day. Okay. Yeah. The campfire. <laughs> At the campfire that we are not allowed to go to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting a lot of comments here, but they're not questions. I wondered if people did have questions. Oh, there's two in the Q&A. Yeah, but, but they say, Lydia, you are the best. Happy Pride, everyone. Oh, they I, do. I said, yeah. And then another one says, Lydia, it was such a pleasure meeting you at Hedgebrook in 2017. Any recommendations for preserving, persevering on a debut book? Yeah, let's talk about that because this book took you 10 years. That's how did Brenna, you keep going? Hi, Brenna. Um, it's nice that Brenna came. Um, how, what was the, how did I persevere? It, yeah, yeah. It was, I think part of it was, delusion because I just kept feeling like oh I'm almost done for 12 years and I wasn't but it was like if I told myself I'm almost done like if someone had told me like right out of my MFA it will take you 12 years to finish that book I'll be like oh my god I don't I, I'm I don't I hope I wouldn't have given up but it would have been really bleak to, to know so I think part of it was the delusion of like I don't know, someone was talking to me about this the other day and I was like, I feel like there's two delusions I have while writing that seem almost like in conflict with each other, but they are simultaneously in my mind. And one is that this will be like done soon, whatever I'm working on. And <laughs> the other is no one will ever read it. So I'm like, I have to remember those two things, but it's like, that's not, that's not possible. But I think, yeah, just, I think what would help you persevere, Brenna, or not you specifically, but you know, that to answer that question is just like 
reminding yourself, which I had to do millions of times. And I wish I believed more that it just like, it takes a long time to make something good for most people probably. And people will be there waiting for you when it's ready. Like people aren't going to disappear. It's not a rush. It's so much better to spend the time to make something good than to rush it out because you're panicking like that 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 everyone's going to forget about you because they won't yeah they won't forget about you they won't forget and you. here's another good one from chelsea catherine who are some other trans and non-binary writer non-binary writers you think we should read or who you like reading Ooh, okay i know there's um nuclear family by catapult up uh, on catapult by yes. joseph Hahn coming out soon i haven't gotten to read it yet but i'm excited to read it and i know there's been a lot of good buzz about it and um, i can arrange that you can arrange it cool <laughs> <laughs> um i i also love detransition baby by tori peters that came out last year that was kind of like the breakthrough probably trans book um i'm trying to think do you have other ones in mind, Lee. I feel like it's oh, oh yeah. There was this great book at Catapult we did that I didn't edit it. It was Julie Bunton, and it was Jess. Um, it's going to take me a minute. I'm afraid I'm going to say Jess Walters, which is the wrong name. Um, at some point, you'll start talking, and then I'm going to look it up. Oh, it's and not, you know, I I remembered two more. One is um, Paul takes the form of a mortal girl by Andrea Lawler, which I love, which is kind yeah. of a speculative trans book. And then if you're into poetry, Ari Banias is both of his books are amazing. So those are probably some good places to start, I'd say. But in a way, it's so great that your book out is coming out. You know, we need more books. <laughs> Obviously, the fact that you and I are racking our brains you know, to come up with five books, we need more. So I, th I think you need to, which leads us to another question. What do you like about writing short fiction? Okay, that's one part. And do you plan to write something longer? This is from Richard Mirabella, also a catapult author. Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I have been working on many a novel for the last 12 years, also alongside these stories. And I keep junking them out and then starting over because this, this doesn't feel like I got it right but I am working on a novel now so hopefully it's getting close and I've just you know been working on it with my agent and re reworking it and stuff like that so I do hope it's getting close but one thing I love about short fiction I think for one thing as a writer there's a sense of accomplishment of being able to actually finish something and see it for what it is in a way that's really, really hard with a novel. Um, if you realize, oh, <clears throat> I went in the wrong direction with a novel, it's incredibly hard to switch gears, whereas you have a, can hold a story in your hand almost and mold it in a certain way. But I do love short fiction so much, like Lee's book, Nobody Gets Out Alive. I I adored and I was just reading it to someone and we were laughing and crying and so into it and also out there by Kate Folk which is another book that came out just a month or two ago is is so amazing speculative tech world fiction so I think it's kind of a per a perfect sized art form to like read a story go through this whole world like the best short story is you see like the whole world of a character in one story and you get to basically have a mini novel that you can just enjoy in an hour and put it to the side and then read it I, it's I think it's perfect for sort of the age of distraction a perfect form I do too and I also think that stories have changed like I remember being with older maybe I don't, that's not very nice way I'm going to say that, like more traditional editors and like sitting at a table. And one of them would always say, oh, that's not a short story. You know, short stories are 17 pages to 20. And I'd be like, in the age of the typewriter, they were yeah. like technology is, you know, I find you, you and I stories are very similar in the sense that they're, they tend to be longer. They're, sometimes they're 30 pages. Sometimes they're 35. Sometimes yeah. they're more. Um, and, and for me, like, that's how you get so that extra length allows you to do that depth of characterization you're talking about, where you can go back into someone's past and really figure out who that is. And that's why the, the stories have more heft, you know, and it does feel like you read a novel, not just because of length, right? It's what you do with the length. But I do think 
it'd be really hard to write a whole chunk in 17 pages. Then it's more about the situation, right? Like, oh, they bought a car and it, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and I would never write a story. Who are these that. people? Yeah. 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 And then there would be about more about the broken car. But when you have 35 pages and you can talk about, you know, why the um, sex addict librarian bought the, the ferrets and should she keep them? It's more about the librarian. Yeah. Than about the, the situation. Right. Yeah. Um, I love this question from Jay Bro Brown. The okay. teens in this book, to me, are the funniest and most heartbreaking. They are always up for some edgy danger. This rang so true for me competing for attention. What did you draw upon to craft these teens? Oh, great question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of it was my own experience, but I feel like it's, I mean, Lee, you have at least one young person narrator in your book. Oh, I have some young, oh, some young children. Ch and but I, not teen, not teen. I More don't know how to write a teenager. I was such an angry teenager. There's no humor in that for me. Like I'm the worst teen writer in the world. Like the idea of me being in charge of a YA thing would be, it's a, a, no, it's like bleak. As a matter of fact, in my first memoir, my, my editor had to say, we just have to cut the whole section after you get past age 12 to 21. Because oh, no. you do not come off very well. Oh no. <laughs> oh my God. I'm still a brat. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true for you. I you want to write, read that part though. Oh God. Oh, but you write actually what you're able to do with the teenagers, especially in the story. I think that's the one that was in the Paris Review too. The suburbs. Right. Ooh, the suburbs. Um, about these two friends who are sneaking out to meet um, a lesbian that they met on, uh, I want to say like some kind of AOL chat board. AOL instant messenger. Yes, they did. I'm pulling it right out of my unconscious, but that's also makes me laugh, right? Like, I don't, it makes me giggle, AOL instant messenger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you show the vulnerability of these characters, of your teen characters. I mean, not just the, like there is, they are doing edgy danger, but they're still kind of like puppies. Like they get in a kind of romantic yet uh, weird tussle in the snow and and haul her feelings about what's going on. Can you talk about that? Like, what is, why are you so absolutely amazing about writing teenagers? Oh, that's so nice. I don't know. I feel like I somehow, I feel like sort of maybe my quintessential age of me, it's like 12 years old. So I feel like yeah. still very like attached or not necessarily attached, but I feel like I have like a, a straight through line to that age and whereas some people when they talk about I don't know I have also a really really eerily good memory and people are always creeped out by the things I remember about them but so maybe that's part of it but I feel like when people sometimes remember their teen years or their childhoods they gloss it over in a certain way or don't remember that they understood come like complexities that they did yeah. understand and like the darkness of the world and maybe it's easier if you have to like engage with other children as an adult or be a parent or an aunt or uncle or whatever as teacher to think that there's this flatness to to what the experience is but there really wasn't so I'm I'm just interested in in sort of exploring or I was in this book and exploring sort of that complexity of experience that people it is weird forget. because teenagers are like portrayed so one-dimensionally yeah. in like movies you know you'd think that you know like they're always like smacking gum and telling their parents to fuck off and you know what I mean or like going out and when I meet teenagers they are so raw and bumbling I have one and by meet them I mean go home <laughs> yeah. uh, but they are <laughs> they uh, are especially like sometimes I'll, I, you know, you look at them and you can just see, they think that they're old, but they're so beautifully vulnerable. I love like being in an airport and watching the teenagers, you know what I mean? And I just think, oh, you know, on the outside, you're 17, on, on the inside, you're like nine. Yeah, totally. It's like the different sort of things that have to develop like empathy or whatever are just developing in the most different. I think they do have frame. empathy. I feel like yeah. they're empathetic with the whole thing. You know, they just yeah. don't know what to do with all the feelings. Yeah. Like, some, like fish of feeling jumping all over their face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it. It's a really amazing thing. Oh, but we have another one here. Anne, 
Adamski. Annie Adamski, that's my sister. Oh, I oh hello. Hi, Anne. Do we have to wait another 12 years for the next book? We will if we have to. Hi. Oh, no, my God. She said that's said with love. So um yeah. You said you're working on a novel. Do you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, we don't have to talk about it if you feel like it's going to jinx your writing. Um, I don't think, I hope it shan't, but I, yeah, I have a novel. It's, it's, it's called Songs No Provenance and it does deal with sort of some issues that are in this book, like non-binary identity and um, storytelling and queerness and queer baiting. But then it also sort of, deals a lot with art making and the ethics around art making and appropriation and that kind of thing and it, it is following a folk singer a 43 year old folk singer who's sort of questioning her whole career and moving into a different world because of a horrible event that happened so that's that I see no humor in that quite yet except for the word folk there. singer folk singer I know you just <laughs> yeah, folk singer, I, folk. Think I, I think I may think that other things are funny that are not funny. I know there's lots of serious folk singers out there, but I have a feeling that you've created a quirky, hilarious take on folk swingers. I just I'm gonna guess that. Yeah. Um, well, this has been so wonderful. Um, maybe we should oh wait, there's some some ones in the chat. Holiday. Um, maybe we Holiday should ask the question. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah. Sue, hello. Hi, Lid. I'm still struggling with the question of how to write fiction without talking solely about real life. Do, you and everybody. How yeah. do, does one decide between writing memoir and writing autobiographical fiction? Oh, okay. So maybe we should talk to audience just quickly about the difference between memoir and then there's what's now called auto fiction, which is when you write it as a novel, but you call it, uh, but it's really your life, like Ocean Vong's book, which was, I, I don't know whether he, I know he's talked about it being auto fiction but it wasn't yeah. written, so, yeah. Um, and then there's just straight old fiction where you're pretending that it's all fiction or it really is made up out of your mind. Anyway, just so people would know, yeah. do you wanna talk about that a lot? Cause it's a huge topic right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me personally, there's such a mix of my own experience and everything I made up. Like sometimes it's like the emotional situation is true but the characters are made up. Yes. Or it's like the emotional situation is true. The characters are true. What happens is made up. So I just, I, I wrote a, two uh, nonfiction pieces to like help promote this book that came out yesterday. And it was the first time I really wrote nonfiction that wasn't in comics. And it was a big struggle for me because my instinct is to just go wild. Um, oh, someone asked what they are there. One is on catapults and it's um, called fostering and it's about sort of learning how to love as a queer person parallel to fostering a string of 40 dogs that I fostered in my 20s um, and the other one is about going to residencies because I've gone to probably like I don't know 17 to 18 residencies or something like that so that one is up on lit hub um, but yeah I just whenever I try to write nonfiction, I just start making up stuff so I just need yeah. to I, I can't, I, I can't, I didn't make up anything in those, those essays, but it was really hard for me to restrain myself from not just like going off into like, you know, making stuff up. Well, that's probably a sign, right? Like if, like, because in memoir, you really gotta, gotta tell the truth even more now than ever, although I, you know, but if you do start making things up, uh, maybe that impulse is what makes the decision for you, right? Yeah, exactly. That was teaching me like, oh no, I shan't be trusted in this pursuit. Yeah, I'm not even, I don't even think I can be trusted with auto fiction. Really? I think I can make up things that would be too much to be auto fiction. Really? But I guess don't be worried because I would do the exact techniques you talked about. Yeah. Maybe it's the real person. I made up the whole situation in the story, right? Or, yeah. Or, or I, the situation was real and I put all these more interesting people into it. But is that really auto fiction? That doesn't seem like autofiction for me because autofiction, I feel like it's got to really come from my dilemmas, my soul, Lee Newman, you know, yeah. and I guess I'm, I don't want to, I'm going to say this in a way that's just very confusing. I just don't know whether as an artist, I'm that interested in unpacking myself anymore. I, I wrote that memoir and I, I, I shiver with horror that I did yeah. it. I loved it. I'm proud of it. I'm just saying it's a whole different beast, right? Yeah, it's a different journey. Yeah. Would you ever write a memoir? Have you ever thought about it? 
I don't know. I actually thought about it when I was doing that catapult essay about the fostering dogs, because I was like, I could see focusing on each of the dogs and and what yes. that told about my life. I think there's, I would love to read that book. Really? Yeah. 40 dogs. <laughs> 40 dogs. 40 dogs. And also the fact that they were fosters and like the whole dilemma of like, keep the dog. How did you each time give up the dog? It was just- really hard. I have some that I still think about. I mean, they're probably all dead now, but I have some that I, that I, oof, I miss so much, but I, my lifestyle was such that I would, I would always be like, I want to keep this dog. And then this family would come with like three acres in Westchester. And it was like, how can I keep this dog in my like 200 square foot apartment in Chinatown when he could go to this beautiful life? And that's part of love too, is giving them, giving somebody, giving up your own feelings to, for the feelings of somebody else. Yeah. Which is something some of your characters do too. True, true. Yeah. Well, this was so wonderful. I think we're supposed to stop talking now. Oh, yeah. We've run out of time. Um, but I am going to just shamelessly plug you guys to buy this book. It was one of the joys of my life working on such a talented artist like Lydia. Oh, Natural food travel. And everything. I still, when I look, I just carried this book with me through three weeks of Alaskan wilderness in my bag because I was like wanted to have the book when we did this talk oh. um just I know a lot of you know her but you can buy two books even you could have one that you bought another store and you could buy one right now that's oh. all I'm just putting it out there um thanks again uh thank you so much Lee for joining me and for and thanks to pals and for having us thank oh, you oh it was great yeah thank you both so much uh yeah i mean it's been it was great to just listen to you both it was fantastic you're both great great conversationalists there and that was a thrill and to learn so much about this book um i put a link to the book in the chat check on pals.com look it up um i um and also are you there also check out Lydia's books it's an amazing well. masterpiece yeah. <laughs> definitely so check out that too um and yeah, you know, while you're there, check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events. We've got all kinds of things like that. And uh, we hope to see you at, again, at one again. And happy Pride Month, everyone. So, and uh, thank happy you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for attending, everyone. Yay. Thanks. Good night.